Welcome to the Natural Health Podcast, where we bring awareness of sustainable health in the business hustle space. The Natural Health Podcast is perfect for the high-performing business-minded individuals who want to work with their biochemistry to achieve optimal health. It's Friday, which means it's time for friends sharing facts about health, business, and overall success. In today's episode, we talk to Nim Shukla, I hope I pronounced that right, who will talk about how we're able to step into authentic self. Nim was born in London and has lived of over three continents and is currently based in south of Spain. He's an English teacher where he prepares students for Cambridge-based exams and works with kids too because he absolutely loves being a kid himself. In summer 2017, he had a spiritual awakening and his life has changed ever since. Now he calls himself a trainee channeler and is working on Reiki and energy healing sessions with others. Interesting fact about Nim is that he was born with 12 fingers and has experienced four near-death experiences. Thank you for joining. Welcome to the Natural Health Podcast. Thank you very much, Mahana. The pleasure's all mine. Beautiful. I don't know where to start. What, the 12 fingers, the four death, near-death experiences? Please. <laughs> What, what, what would you like to know first? So you were born with 12 fingers. Which ones? Where were they? What happened? <laughs> so, uh, okay. For the, for the purpose of the video, I'll show you if you can see it. Um, so there's a marking just there. Yeah. And there's one just there. Wow. So on both uh, hands, you had one extra one on both hands on your pinkies, the individuals who can't see the video and are listening. Yeah. There's marks on the hands on both the pinkies. So one on the left and one on the right. And that's the additional two fingers. Yes. And they got removed. They were surgically removed as far as uh, I'm aware. Yes, they were, uh, they were taken up because they were very, they were very minute in, in size. They hadn't developed a structure, um, for, for them to be actually used and um, so I mean they were really tiny all, yeah. All these things. yeah and so the yeah they just I, I, as far as I remember I think my mum told me that what they did is they tied a little string very lightly around it they um, the the doctors and nurses tied a little string around it and the, the idea was to sever the blood circulation to it so that it would just and it did about wow. seven days later they just sort of dropped off that's not something anyone can say. That's definitely, <laughs> I love it. It's definitely a party trick or, you know, icebreaker right there. So what about like, you know, people could talk about one near death experience, but four. Wow. What is that all about? Well, um, my, my four uh, are at the time I had no idea why they happened. They were just close shaves. Uh, so as to say, say, so, but I was, uh, Post my spiritual awakening in 2017, I get I started getting a lot of realizations one after the other in succession, and it all occurred to me that these were kind of sort of pre these were kind of like um, seeds, if you if you like, um, they were sort of precursors leading up to uh, the spark, the ignition in 2017 uh, in summer here in the north. Northern Hemisphere of the, the planet, um, and you know, it, over a period of time, I started to understand. It's like, um, I mean, this is a, a quite far fetched, and that's why I don't expect everyone to believe me. But you know, each their own. I respect that. Um, but for example, what I, the first one that happened was when I was. Uh, it was the summer of 1991 um, in London. Uh, I used to live in Wimbledon in South London, where they played tennis. Wimbledon Town is just literally about a 10 minute drive from where I used to live. Um, my parents had a, a house uh, and I found some matches and I started playing with them. I started burning the plastic sheath that covers a, a mattress. Um, plastic starts to burn very fast, as I discovered very early on in my life on that day. <laughs> um, uh, I put it out, let it again in my curiosity of, oh, fire. Mm. And um, before I knew it, the, it spread across the, the sort of the, the mattress and the, the, the bottom part of the frame of the bed. Um, and my sister was doing her makeup, looking in the mirror, and she couldn't understand the reason why the bed was on fire behind her. And I was just sitting there looking up at her like that. Um, in, in, I, I don't know if I was in shock or, or I don't remember being in shock. Um, 
next minute she panics, she runs out of the house, goes and tells my, my mom, and my mom thinks, oh, it's her and her friend just being silly 11, 12 year old girls. And, uh, my sister eventually said, no, mom, seriously, the bed is on fire upstairs. So my mom got her, her in-laws out, my dad's parents out. Um, she got herself out, the dog, my sister, my sister's friend who was around. Uh, and they left me upstairs by, uh, in a panic. They forgot about me. Uh, this, at this point, the uh, flames started hitting the carpet. The, the, the entire carpet around me was on fire. The bed, the door, the door frame was on fire. The flames were hitting the ceiling. Um, and where I was, the funny thing was, the flames had spread in such a way where, where I was actually sat. I didn't move at all from where I was sat, I guess, for about a good 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, there was a lot of smoke everywhere. And around me, there was like a circle, half a circle. And the flames sort of started to slow down as they were coming in, which was strange. Um, and I realized later, well, post my spiritual awakening, I realized that was my, my team of spirit guides. Uh, my, I, I believe, I've, I've, been saying, I, I've been given this vision that they are angelic. They've got wings around them. They all stood locking hand, arms around me, made a semicircle, just to delay it long enough for a very kind gentleman to come through the window, a fireman, and he carried me down his shoulders. I got out of there, no burns, no scratches, nothing. No concussion. Wow. I just got goosebumps all over my body listening to that. That is crazy. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. At such a young age, being exposed to something like that and then surviving yeah. with not even a scratch or a little burn. And it's not a little yeah. fire. We're talking about the whole room. Yeah, this was this was a five a five bedroom a four bedroom house, uh, which I think probably uh, by the t- by the time they put the flames out, the front part of it was decimated. Wow. That's absolutely crazy. That's us. And, and yeah, that's absolutely amazing. So that's just one of the stories and there's three more. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, the following one happened uh, two years later. Uh, my family and I, we left, uh, when we moved to Kenya. My father had brothers living at the time in Kenya. So we moved to Kenya, to East Africa. Um, and I was playing with a cousin of mine in a um, sort of a sand pit. I mean, where my cousin lived was a very nice sort of house, a bungalow. Uh, and they had quite a lot of land and on the plot of land that they were living on, they had another space. They had an empty space in which they were building another ho- uh, land to another house to rent out or use as a holiday home for people to come and sort of have a holiday. Um, and when that house was under being, un- it was undergoing construction at the time, this was 1993. Um, it was, it was a uh, summer holiday, so schools closed. I went to spend the week sort of summer with, with my few couple of my few of my cousins, three of my cousins and their mum and dad. Um and uh yeah, it was just a, an accident and we were, we were playing in some sand. There was a garden digger, which you used to dig you you dig into to soil to get you know to up you to root up the soil, remove roots, etc. It's probably about that wide and probably about that high. And it's a very fine blade. The blade went straight onto my head. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, and I was uh, without going into too much detail. I was literally covered in my blood from head to toe um, at the age of eight. It was eight it was, yeah, it was about eight, uh, seven and a half, eight. Um, I was covered, dripping. He he obviously panicked. He ran inside, told his mum. His mum grabbed a hand of sugar. She threw it at my head. She grabbed another hand of salt. She threw that on my head. Uh, now you probably think, why, why salt on a wound like, on an open wound like that? That's the worst thing you could do. Um, I actually, re- I actually realised that <laughs> salt. From that, I discovered that salt, yeah, it will, it will burn, and I mean, literally, it will, it, your head will be on fire. Um, but it kills bacteria, as I'm sure somebody with you know, with your knowledge about health and etc. and bio, your biochemistry, it kills bacteria. The sugar uh, binds the cells of skin together so I left that for about a few days and I did not go to hospital not one stitch my head is completely fine today wow that is absolutely crazy that is extraordinary and you're here today everything's all good you're healthy you're yeah. safe <laughs> no memory loss nothing no uh, I don't even think I've got skull damage or, or um, certainly not brain damage I don't think I've got skull. I think there's like I feel like a little mark from time to time um, yeah. But that's about it. 
That is absolutely crazy. Uh, and, you know, luckily everything went well. And, I mean, definitely yes. you've got some – you've got a group of good people looking after you, don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they've they watched over me. Um, they, they've watched over me for years. And it's like um, – the next one that happened was not very, not was probably about six months later. Um, driving through Kenya, my mum had just come over um, from, from the UK. She just moved over. My sister and I went first to get in school there. Um, and we were driving through town. We went to get some, uh, it's like this, follow uh, that is like an Arabic or, uh, uh, but it's quite, um, even for, for Indians like myself, it's uh, it's quite a common thing. To, it's just like a little smoothie with um, uh, uh, kind of like, I don't know what call it. it's like a, a jelly, a very sort of jelly, jelly string thing in it. Um, it's like a smoothie. It's supposed to be quite sweet and stuff and people drink it. Um, and we were driving through uh, and there was political riots. Riots had broken out and there were people throwing models of cocktails and stuff, you know, the glass bottles on fire. I stood up at uh, the back of the pickup. Everybody, all my cousins were all, the, you know, <laughs> I just stood up, stood up in my curiosity. And I had a bit of uh, the Matrix, I had a bit of a Matrix moment in that literally a stone about so was being hurled. It was literally coming at my face. And I just moved and it went straight past. Wow. That's the, the stories you're currently saying is definitely not one, you know, every person would say that they've had near death experiences like yourself. So that's definitely a wow. And, you know, and I think, I think like what you're talking about, a key turning point in your journey to lead you to where you are today. And I think, are there any, what my question is, is there any other key turning points in your life that have yeah. led you where you are now, what you're doing now? And what are you doing now? Um, Key turning point. Yeah, uh, it, it's been more progressive in my case. I think with, with some of the people that have been through their spiritual awakenings, it's been a lot more traumatic. I mean, they've some. I've heard some stories of people that have been through really. really I mean, uh, it, it is unimaginable what they've been through um, in comparison to what I've what I've experienced. My but mine post my 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 awakening in twenty seventeen, it's been more progressive and gradual. Um, I just. Uh, yeah, for me, it's like I just see repeating numbers, 11, 11, 4, 4, 4, you know, that's happened. I've had feather, angel feathers come through my window um, into my room, waking up. Um, just the other day, this summer, uh, this holiday, I had about two of them in there. So in a week, on two separate days, I, they, sort of bird feathers came through. And I just thought, that's a bit strange. But I, they say that it's a sign of uh, an angelic presence. Um, but I normally get like a stream of consciousness. So I get like information coming to me and t- telling me, I just get sudden ideas and understandings. It's the reason why certain things happened, why certain people said things to me, why certain things have evolved in, in my life. And what's what, you know, to kind of integrate that with the shadow aspect of it is, um, it's made me realize that when I get the explanation or understanding of something, I stop pointing the blame. Uh, for example, I won't, now I don't, I don't blame my ex-girlfriend uh, or any of, any of my ex-girlfriends, I don't blame them for what they've done, for what they, what, who, you know, I said to them to this and they said this to me because I've gained the understanding. My spirit guides will just drop me an idea in my head that this is why she said this to you because you needed to learn this out of it. And I've got the understanding that's made me grow as a person, uh, personally, emotionally, spiritually, it's made me grow a lot. Yeah, wow. So what is it that you're doing at the moment right now? You've mentioned a bit of... Um, shadow work, angelic, reiki, channeling, what, what, what's leading you? What has led you to where you are now? So um, change of career was the first thing because um, I, I, <laughs> coming to Spain was not even, on, uh, not even on the books for me. It wasn't, I wasn't part of the plan. My family moved here, but I was not part of the plan. My grandmother was. I just broke up with my ex-girlfriend um, two hours later. I made the decision to move to Spain, so that was... That it was offered to me on the table, and I said, "Okay, fine. I'm not going to say no." Um, becoming a teacher was was in, um, has led me to inner child healing uh, because I get to be a kid, big kid myself. It's brought about awareness even to things like nutrition in, in recent times as well. Um, not that I'm a, not that I'm actually. <laughs> I must admit, I'm not the best person when it comes to sticking to my diet, um, but I try and be as aware as I can these days. Um, yeah, and then in terms of what I'm doing is is more 
So I'm actually doing um, angel Reiki is what I'm offering the service to people at the minute. Um, so it's basically Reiki, but involving uh, angelic presence. Um, I am angel Reiki qualified. I've got a diploma in it now. I've done a course, finished it. Uh, I've very recently finished my channeling course uh, where I now stream into consciousness of my team that come through and basically trying to get the chilly opportunity to talk to them through me. Wow. Um, uh, they get to have, they're very childish. They, they always do things like this. Very, they're a child, but that's just how I am when I teach kids. Um, and shadow work, the integration of shadow work is because everything's, you know, I've got to the understanding. It's not just about all, every, everything's not just about love and light, but it's also about embracing the darkness within you and understanding why that darkness is there, why that shadow is there, what is it in that shadow that should be making you authentic, which is obviously what we're talking about today. The authenticity lies quite deeply rooted in the very core depths of the shadow, not in what a lot of people uh, within the spiritual community have this full sense of uh, understanding that everything's about all oh, just numbers and you know and rainbows and unicorns and you know it's that might be one aspect of it, but what also needs to be a, 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 what we need to pay attention to is bring awareness and a veer to, uh, to, the, to the, the rule of balance, like the yin and yang. You know, you've got to embrace the darkness as well. You've got to understand what's causing you to have this darkness within you. Make it a part of you. Don't challenge it, but don't let it consume you. Yeah. Bring balance between the two. Yeah, I think, I think having that balance, like you said, that's absolutely key. And I think we miss a lot of it. We think, you know, yes. Yeah. There's the white and the sun and the happiness and the joy and the love. And we want to feel like that most of the time. And then when we come to a stage where we're feeling, you know, sad, we're feeling upset, we're feeling hurt, you know, that we don't really want to tap into because that's not, we don't see that as us. That's something else. That's not us. We are like, you know, all, all of that. So it's kind of like what you said in regards to balancing it up. I love that idea. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so there's, there's so many key things that have happened in your life that have led you now yeah. to, to where you are now to being a true authentic you. But I mean, um, there would have been, there would have been things in your life where you didn't really feel authentic, right? You didn't feel like, yes. let, so let's talk about authenticity. So authenticity, what I found here is the degree to which a person's actions are concurrent with his or her beliefs and desires despite external pressure to conformity. Mm -hmm. What is your type of, what's your definition of, of being authentic and being an authentic self? My definition, if someone was to ask me, I would uh, just say, be yourself. Practice self-love. Ask yourself and question yourself about your motives, your actions, your thoughts, your feelings, your words. Um, and... The way I would explain it is more, rather than give a broad definition, I like to give a definition using relationships because relationships, romantic relationships in particular, uh, is, is something everybody likes to, because you know, the human psyche, the human conscious, the human psyche uh, loves talking about romance, everybody loves having someone in their life, etc. But you look at the number of failed marriages today, um, uh, I've, I've never been married, I've been, well, sort of, talk to two to my separately but you know been almost engaged to them but um what i've realized is you you look, you look at people's relationships how many of them are actually happy in a marriage the number is quite obviously very low the reason being is because from day one they never were authentic and if they were they you know some of them may have hidden things with their partner and stuff and you know i get it everybody's entitled to their privacy they don't have to do with everything but um but they should try and at least uh, communication is also authentic. People don't communicate, which is why they end up arguing. They build up and like a, like a, a wave of magma. They just explode like a volcano that breaks down communication. So authenticity, people look at the relationships, romantic relationships in particular, they break down and they break down for one, because of community, lack of communication or ineffective communication Two. They're not just, they're simply not being authentic. They're not practicing self-love. They're not drawing boundaries and saying, oh, well, look, this is interest. This is of interest to me. Um, that's the reason why uh, it's important to me. 
I don't expect you to be a part of it. That's fine. But I expect you to give me my space for me to do it or participate in it. If you can't do that, this is not going to work. And it should exactly. be vice versa. It shouldn't just be a one-way, you know, one-way traffic. It's got to be a two-way system. The other person needs to reciprocate and say, okay, well, that's of interest to you. I'm not really into all that, but it's important to you, so I will respect it. It's important to me. You can have your time to do what you need to do. And doing things like that, um, actually, I've realized it actually stops people from even being very clingy, wanting to attach themselves to one another, because then they're like saying, oh, I always want to be around you. Yeah, well, give each other some space. Go and do what's important to you. You should go and do what's important to you. You know, you like doing art. You like doing walking in the forest on your own. It helps you to think. Well, go and do it. It takes some time away from it. It doesn't have to be about, a, you know, you, could be, you haven't had an argument with your partner. Everything's fine, but you just need some, you know, maybe you need to think about where you want to go in life next or where you want to move next. Or maybe, you know, maybe you're thinking, like, should I ask her or him to move in with me? Or pop the question, whatever. You know, people can, can use this time productively, creatively, um, instead of get, getting up to things they want not to be doing. Yeah, and, that, and that's where the external pressure comes in, doesn't it? As in for us, um, as an individual, we are made to be like, okay, your partner is supposed to do this. You are supposed to do this. As yeah. a woman, you're supposed to do this. As a man, yes. you're supposed to do this. As a son, as a daughter, as a cousin, yeah. as a friend. It's kind of like we have been given this manual when we we're born and it's like, okay, yeah. now you have to tick all of these boxes to be a good yeah. human being. So yeah. how, like the thing that I'm, the thing that, you know, a lot of individuals and especially the audience listening are kind of like, well, I've been given this manual, right? And yeah. I want to tick all the boxes because I want to be accepted into community and I want to be that good person. But sure. how can I still be authentic? It's a, it's a difficult question and uh, the, it's a difficult question to, un to understand and think about, but the answer is actually in front of people. Practice self-love. If you love yourself enough, you've got yourself to a place of, you can't get yourself to a place of complete self-love. I don't think so, because if you did, you probably have a realization of what human consciousness truly is and it's not here. It's probably at a very high, much sort of higher level outside of the body. Um, but for the purpose of being living here in reality or what some people would perceive as reality, um, practicing self-love is, you know, just learning to love yourself. And I, I think, you know, you look at, you look at some of the, the relationships um, that people have experienced in their life. And this might be a trigger for the audience, you know, um, and I really apologize to anybody who's listening to this, but um, some people have had uh, a narcissistic partner. They've had somebody that is so controlling of their life. They're, they've had somebody, and that, that could be in itself, usually that's a wound within the family. Um, because that kind of person, that person is going to more than likely continue it to attract that kind of partner. It's cyclic. It's going to be, they're going to continue doing it unless they've done the inner work and said to themselves, no, I'm going to draw a boundary with this kind of person. You're not going to tell me what to do. No, no, but you're going to do what I do because I tell you to do that. No, in that case, bye. I don't want you to be a part of my life because that's not how the, that's not how I work. That's not how a relationship works for me. That's the kind of attitude that people need to embrace. They need to they need to kind of exude that you know exude that level of confidence that they don't have to put up with with somebody else's thing, and they have to break. Part of the journey is breaking all these patterns. As you said, you, you use the analogy of, of manuals. It's like, and it's, it's like a stereotype. It's like, you know, the man has to go to work. The woman has to stay at home. She has to be the, but why can't he be your house husband and she go to work? What's, what's wrong with that gender role the other, being the other way around? You know, or both of you go to work and both of you help each other at home, you know, keep balance, whatever. But human society has created these things. Um, people at the hierarchy at the top have created these things because they want to control people. That's the reality. They want to control society. They want to control people. They want to dictate and govern how people should live their lives inauthentically. You should mm. follow the system. So if you follow the system, you're, you're a part of the hierarchy. You're a slave to somebody. Yeah. My, my opinion is break away from that slavery. Cut your own path out. If you feel that a relationship's not for you, um, 
whatever, we'll play from them. You know, I'm, I've been single, what, four and a half years and I'm still single and I'm not, at the moment, I don't think, I'm not interested in, in anything. I don't do casual dating. I'll get to know somebody. Uh, if something happens, it clicks. If not, I'm more than happy to continue with my life. I do, I'll be honest, I will confess. I do, just yesterday, I actually had a bout of loneliness. I do get from time to time, I wish I had somebody. I wish, you know, I could lay down next to a nice, you know, a nice woman. But you have to ask yourself, do you want, do you want that? And if you in a state when you're you're not ready for a relationship, where it's because you're busy with other things in your life, building your life, or mm. do you want to run the risk of having your heart broken or breaking somebody else's heart? Take your pick. It's better to wait, uh, let things play out for themselves. It might seem like it's procrastination. You're delaying, you know, wanting to settle down. Your parents are telling you. Some cultures, they're always like, yeah, but you need to get married. You need to have children. You know, it's quite quite pressured. Um, I understand particularly for women. Generally, they're the ones, they're the ones who are going to be mothers. So, you know, for them, it's like, you know, you need to get you need to get married, you need to get pregnant, have children. I want to see my grandkids before I die. Um, but it shouldn't be the case. People should be able to say to their parents, no, I'm not going to do that because that's not me. Yeah. Um, my dad tried to, my, I mean, my dad set, set up a it just stopped. India. Sorry, can you repeat that again? Because it just, it went mute. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Can, you, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, I can hear you now. Go on. Yeah, okay. So, um, so uh, for instance, my, my dad uh, set up uh, dating profiles online without my consent uh, in my sort of late teens, early 20s. And you know, I get it, as a father, he was interested, he was worried about me get, getting me married off. And he was trying to, he kept saying, what do you think about this girl? You know, you know, it's a very common thing in India for Indian families. And he got me, um, you know, he showed me a few, and I said, dad, look, I'm not interested. I don't, I don't want to get married to anybody from India. I don't think them and I are going to be compatible. You know, I said, look, dad, I'm happy finding love when it's the right time. Yeah. Um, but I think it takes, I think it takes a certain individual, certain power within yourself to stand up and be authentic like you were and yes. saying, well, no, I'm not going to be that um, Indian man that gets married and has kids at the age of 25, um, you yeah. know, and have a housewife at home and things like that. So I think to be truly authentic, you know, like you said, you need to have self-love and set boundaries. Absolutely. So what triggered you to, to be authentic? Because you are authentic at the moment. So what, what has helped you to find your true self and stick to it? Uh, a constant test of nature. Um, pretty much right from my birth because the family that I was born in was not... Um, I, I had a lot of extreme, you know, uncalled for behaviours in my family. There were a lot of... You know, there's a lot of masculine wounding, um, wounding from the masculine side. Um, and all, all the men have got all these imprints and I, I see it all now as, as I progressed on my journey. I've started to see the patterns and see the suffering in them and how they projected their, their, um, their abuse of me. Like my dad was very abusive towards me physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, he extinguished a cigarette on my leg, for example, when I was a kid. Um, and that had, that was only because of, of not being able to spell a word that I'd never, I'd never come across before. For doing my, for not, you know, misspelling a word, I actually had to pay the price with a cigarette on my leg. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just masculine wound, you know, I get it now. And it's just like, um, for me, how, what's driven me to stand up is my own journey, is, um, is, is the constant challenge by nature. And I, uh, this is why I feel that nature challenge, nature's challenged me, um, my, the higher aspect of my soul, my higher self has challenged me to uh, get me to this place that, you know, you need to stand up for yourself. And periodically, I've noticed that a new challenge comes on, a new lesson comes on. When I face it, when I close my eyes and I jump off the cliff, just submitting, and I say, no, that's it, I'm done. I'm not taking any more of this. I actually feel like I've got my power back. I, um, I got taken away to India at the age of 26. Uh, a one-way ticket to a village and I thought I was never going to come back ever again. Uh, it took me two and a half years to muster that confidence. Um, 
I, was, I lived in India in, in rural India for two and a half years. No life, no friends, nothing. Um, two and a half years. It took me 28. It was, it was quite a lot. I was quite a late bloomer in life. I've always been one. 28, it took me to uh, break away from my dad. 28 years it took me um, of constant suffering um, and uh, abuse, uh, physical, mental, emotional, to, uh, to challenge it. But I, I welcome it. I'm not advocating abuse or anything, but I welcome it now because it's made me where I, what I am today. It, there's you no understand it. You get where it was coming yeah. from, what you said see before. The yeah, I see the patterns in him and his family and, you know, the wounding and the, the societal programming and all sorts. I see all of that. And that's what's made me what I am today because I've said, I'm not going to be that person. If I'm going to have children, my kids are going to have lots of fun. I'll be a strict father, but I'm going to do things differently. They're not going to go through the abuse that I'm going to get, that, that I endured as a child. They will not go through even a fraction of that because that's not the life I want for my children. That's not the life I want for any child. Mm, um, mm. Seeing the amount of poverty visiting an orphanage in Kenya when I was 10, that was a huge uh, thing. Uh, kids who've, whose, whose uh, brothers, you know, 12-year-old brothers had to lift up an AK-47, um, serving a war, uh, an African warlord just so that he can feed his two-year-old sister. That's very disturbing. But when you see that at the age of 10 when you grow up and you get a bit more, gain more of an understanding of the world around you, it starts to trigger things. So it's it's all been part of a journey for me to, yeah. I guess, to share with people and, and say to people uh, and kids that I teach, you know, and they don't, they don't do their homework and stuff. And I get, sometimes I get really annoyed because they don't listen and I'm getting, trying to get into past these Cambridge exams. I say to them, I spent six years of my life in Kenya. This is what I saw a 10 year old boy do. Um, this is what I saw a 12 year old boy do. He had to do this for his two-year-old sister, that's a bit of a wake up call. They're like, really? I'm like, uh -huh. I, I saw it because I went to an orphanage. I saw these children. Yeah. I fed them. And we don't think about these things because we're not exposed to them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And this is why I absolutely love traveling and I, I welcome traveling. Yes. I welcome different cultures. I welcome different, you know, yeah. individuals. And even individuals who, you know, are not in line with my values, I welcome it because I'm like, what have you got to share? What have you got? What experiences have you done that I haven't been through that I can learn yeah. from and get a better understanding? So then I'm able to right. take that upon and go, wow, that is amazing. I haven't experienced that. This is my experience. This is your experience. And we, and we share, you know, and I think that's the beauty of I know before we're talking about you know the internet and the bad and the good and I think that's the beauty about the internet the good side that we are able to use platforms like these to share this Absolutely. knowledge because some audiences may have listened to you and think so much for sharing your vulnerability with us they would have been listening and been like wow I've been through something similar or I've been through this and that and now they can think and go, how can I take that, what has occurred, and turn it into for me to be an authentic self, for me to be me, for me to draw my new life, draw my draw my own life. It's kind of like you've got a blank piece of paper literally in front of you. How do you want your life to be? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really great analogy. I might actually use that. Thank, thank you for that. I might use that. That's scary. That's yeah, scary. It's like... It's, it's a piece of canvas or a piece of paper, um, and and you can draw, you can you can draw, uh, you can paint a picture of your life, so as it were, or draw a picture of your life, a portrait. The pencil's in your hand. The paintbrush is in your hand. Okay, well, what do you want me to draw? Well, it's your life. You draw what you feel is right for you. If you feel that this is your life should be black and white, well, just draw it as black and white. If you feel it should be something, nothing but colours abstract art, just throw the whole thing and just mess it with your hands. There you go. And don't that's, worry that's about it. being judged. Don't worry about it, no. Don't worry that's about being idea. judged. People, people are so easy. Uh, and This is a lesson that I've had to learn myself. And it's a const this is the one that constantly tests me. Um, judgment is massive because it's, like, it's so easy um, to... I, I got this when I was actually shooting my own YouTube videos. Uh, on my channel, and I was I was worried initially. I was over this summer. I started. And I was like, I've only got five subscribers. I've only got ten subscribers. And like, this is not really working out, is it? And then it occurred to me, a couple, a few people, a uh, few of my recent subscribers were very generous and very kind enough to pass some really nice, heartfelt comments. 
And I thought, well, you know what? If two or three people out of a number of 20-odd or 25-odd are actually taking the time to value my work, my efforts, that's how amazing is How beautiful is that? Life. How beautiful exactly. is that? Exactly. I don't need the approval of anybody else. I don't need the approval of my family. I mean, my family don't even know how to do this. I've, I've kept this away from certain members of my family. I've kept it separate. But, you know, I don't... I don't, you know, I don't need to seek the approval of it. I don't need to seek approval from friends or anybody. I just do it. Yeah. That's what yeah. mindfulness is about. It's just about being present in the moment, feeling what you want to feel, doing what you want to do, be authentic. Yeah, I love that. And and it's so easy to fall into the, you know, into the trap of, you it know, is. opening up your own YouTube channel, opening up your own business, um, yeah. starting a new family, writing a book um, and so forth. And it's kind of like a, the judgment that may come with it. And I mean, when individuals put themselves out there, like we are, we are opening ourselves up to so much judgment right now because anything Jeez. that comes out of our mouth anything that we write anything that we post can be seen by someone else or heard by someone else as something else and then we're going to get judged for it but yeah. when when you know you know who you are and you know what you do why you do it then that's a whole different realm isn't it it is it yeah. is when, once once you're in alignment with with what you've got uh who you are and what you are you are in a place with uh, you, you, well, you've got, you've got understanding. You are you're in a place of um, understanding who you truly are. You start, to, and that's when you, that's when the self love starts creeping up. You think, yes, I like this. This is who I am. I like being like this. And when you get to that point, think you, I've actually discovered that romantic relationships, relationships with family, with friends, business associates, it because life just flows because you just think, you know what, whoever comes into my life, if they drop off. It wasn't meant to be. We weren't supposed to be together. We weren't supposed to be friends. We weren't supposed to continue our family relation. Boom, gone. But the people that will stay around you, those are the people. It becomes like a bit of a coffee filter. It's going to retain the residue, the residue but the nice coffee is going to come out for you to drink. You're not going to drink all coffee with the granules. And yeah. So it's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to end up being with a small number of people in my life. However, these people are people that care about me. They value me for who I am and what I am. We might have different values. We might have different beliefs, but we know how to draw a boundary and say, okay, that's fine. You've got those. I've got mine. Um, it's fine. You know, there's, there's nothing. Yeah. I mean, I had a recent experience on my birthday. I had a couple of work colleagues and I went, went for drink, you know, just to out for, you know, for a, a couple of drinks. And um, I, I, I jokingly passed the comment about, Donald Trump and you know one of them I didn't realize one of them wasn't support them and the other was completely against it I completely stay away from politics I have no loyalties to anybody um because I as being judgmentally I'm going to be I'm just going to say they're all out for themselves that's the fact when human society didn't need to just have politicians that what we needed more was people that actually did something about society building our own roads building our own infrastructure building our own life we don't actually need other people to do that because what do we do? We're giving our power to them. Pun intended, literally, you're giving their power to them by voting for them, but you're giving them power to control you. So why do we really need a government? Why do we need politicians? We don't need them. What we need is ourselves. Um, and they got up to They ended up having a bit of a debate about it. And I thought, oh, this is bad. My birthday. <laughs> But it just said, you know, I, I learned something out of it. Um, they told me, they explained to me, no, that's fine, that happened, but you need to learn something out of that. It's not your place to judge people. Whether somebody supports someone or doesn't support somebody, you need to remain authentic. You don't need to judge. It's not your place to judge. Respect people's boundaries, respect their beliefs, whoever they are, wherever, whoever they may be. Well respect. said. That was beautiful said. And, and like you said, some people may not have the same values and beliefs as yourself but i think the key okay. word that you mentioned are boundaries yes i think that's boundaries, a key word yeah boundaries is is such a it, it's such a hot topic um these days it, you know a lot of people are and i'm glad a lot of people are actually paying more and more attention to it and talking about boundaries and drawing them because that is what's going to make us authentic if you don't have any boundaries or if you don't know where to draw a boundary within your sort of inner circle, how are you supposed to stop somebody from crossing it and saying, well, hang on, you can't do that. You're 
taking the mickey with me. You don't get to do that. No, you don't get to do that with me. Um, and yeah, I mean, pe people should, the, one of the best ways to learn it is to think of your romantic relationships. They're the easiest thing to relate to because they are a mirror reflection of what's going on in, inside us internally. And that's our programming that we've got from parents, the music industry, um, or whatever kind of music, whatever we expose ourselves to, you know, uh, social media, uh, schooling, societal level programming, that you need to do this religious programming. You know, I just say, put all that aside, be yourself. Ask yourself, what would I be minus all of this? Think of it as a mathematical equation. If you're quite the scientist or math or geek or nerd, minus take this all this out of the equation, what are you left with? Me, right. Well, then just be you. That's the secret. Because when you start being yourself, you start realizing where your boundaries are. These guys are trying to infringe them. That's what they've done is they've put layers of sand over it and you can't see your boundaries. That's what everyone around you's done that. Blow the sand away, see where your boundaries are, shape them. Yeah. Draw them. Make it very clear cut from day one to everyone. And it's interesting you say that, but the thing is it's it's once you get there, it's like a whole new world. But it's kind of like, oh, that's future Mahala's issues. Or oh, I'll deal with that after I've done this business. I'll deal with that when I have a kid. I'll deal with it when I have money. I'll deal with it when I have a relationship or something like that. It's kind of like it doesn't really ever come at the full front of this is for me to be healthy internally. This is for me to be successful. This is for yeah. me to be the better person that I can be. And, I mean, I think what I wanted to ask you is what actually happens, you know, when – when we're not being authentic, how, how, does, how does that impact us? What happens? Suffering. Suffering is, is basically it because it's, it's suffering and suffocation. You're suffocating yourself, right, by not being yourself. Imagine if you were in a, in a room, a vacuum room, without any air. How would you breathe? A few seconds and then you would choke, calm. So what you're doing is by giving your power away, by not being authentic, by not drawing boundaries, you are saying to people that I'm allowed, I'm, I'm giving you my power, I am enslaving myself to you. People say that this is the days of the slave, slave, the slave trade are over. A certain point of view, yes, that might be true. However, is it really over? Considering the number of things with internally, the amount of power that we give away to people. Um, I mean, I, I'd see it so much as uh, even giving my power away to my employers. So one of the reasons why I'm trying to strike out, I, I'm, I've decided to strike out and be an entrepreneur. I'm setting my own business up on the side as I'm teaching. Um, to, to put, you know, to put food, food on the table and pay my, my, my bills and my rent. Um, but that's... That's how I, I look at it. It's like, well, even, even, your, even your boss is instructing you. There's a hierarchy that's created there. Um, that's why people say, you know, when they look back in history, they look at why Atlantis collapsed, why Lemuria collapsed, why the Roman Empire collapsed, why the pyramid, why the Egyptian uh, um, uh, Empire collapsed. So you think the Egyptians created it, they built pyramids. What was the pyramid? Um, uh, what did it stand for? What did it stand for? Hierarchy. People sit at the top and everybody else is slave labor at the bottom. So it was the slaves that used to drag all, all the, the, the massive bricks, right? But it was their masters, or the slaves of their masters used to whip them to control them. And the slaves used to get the pharaoh, would just sit under the, uh, an umbrella in the shade, drinking wine all day or water or eating grapes. I mean, that's, that's what, but you look at that society is that a very balanced society? No, it isn't. That's why it collapsed. The system failed. Um, Atlantis, same thing. There was balance and then people started getting power, so they became corrupt. They, you know, you had all these priests and priestesses of Margi, they were there. They started to think, oh, that we're superior to you. So there was an imbalance. It collapsed. Mm, mm, mm. So you look at all these societies in history, Empires have collapsed. The British Empire collapsed because when there's control, eventually 
it's like a piece of chewing gum. How long do you stretch it from your mouth? Eventually, it's going to snap. Yeah. No different. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I love that how you said that when we're not being true to us, ourselves, we're equal suffering. Because there yeah. may be individuals out there who currently are in a role, in a relationship, in whatever, in a business that they are suffering and they're not understanding why they're suffering. And it may be because they're not true to themselves. Yes, quite possibly. Yeah. Um, it, it might be, and, it, and it's something, and that's probably where the lesson, one of the lessons among many that they, they would need to learn. Um, if it's any consolation, I'm, I'm still in the process of learning many lessons. One of them is in fact that, that from time to time, even I get tested. Um, I get tested and, you know, to, to the extreme that, oh, am I, am I willing to continue to keep going? Am I willing to, you know, draw my boundaries with people? And I get tested. That's the reason why I get put, you know, I get all these hot headed individuals sent my way. Now I've started to understand why I ended up, I ended up working with hot headed colleagues who, um, I mean, a real test of mine was about 2014 when I left India, I left my parents and I moved back to the UK and I started my life again. I ended up working in, uh, in, a, in, a, in an office and uh, one of my colleagues was a very horrible bully. I mean, he, he really was a bully towards me. Uh, we should car shed, so that was even worse. Um, but it was like, you know, he would ask me questions in the car. Why, why, why does this happen? It was, you know, it was very, inter- you know, almost like an interrogation. It was just, dude, lay, lay off me. Like, it's Friday evening. I don't want to talk about work. But, you know, when, when you don't, you understand that when you draw boundaries with such people, I didn't draw a boundary because he left and ended up going on to another place to work. But um, I learned from that, that when you have these people, these sorts of individuals, these characters, they are teachers. Mm. They are good. They are there to teach you something. So don't. I know it's really difficult, and I will share people's. Um, I, I will. I do understand people's pains. I know, guys. It's so difficult to um, to say, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm scared. I, I get it. There's a fear in you, but it's about facing that fear and say, hang on, you don't get to talk to me like that. What do you mean? You don't get to talk to me like that. No, I, I do. No, 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 you don't, because you are not my boss. You might have a higher authority than me, but you and I, we answer to him or her. You got a problem, you go and tell him or her. Manager, don't take it out on me just because you're having a bad day. That's what, it, you know, whatever it is, if it's something that, you know, you, you're not understanding things at work or, uh, you know. And again, the same thing, how different is it to when children go to school or college and they get bullied? Because it's the people, same. It's, because it keeps what, repeating in our lives, doesn't yeah. it? It does. And I mean, and you find the ones, what, what I have noticed is the people that go through the greatest amount of dirt, the ones that really have to crawl through it, they are the ones who end up rising to the top as much. That's not to say nobody can, everyone's got the potential. But what I have noticed, is, let me rephrase that, what I have noticed is the harder your journey has been, the greater the responsibility you will have. At that time when you're going through whatever you're going through, it's the end of the world. No one understands. It's It's the apocalypse. Yeah. (laughs) It's hurtful. It's painful. You're raw. You're vulnerable. All these emotions. And then when you have the opportunity to look back on it, like you said, it's like, thank you. Yeah, it is. I I, I I thank that buddy because he, he, um, Whatever he may have done and put me through, he's only made me stronger indirectly. So I actually see him, I, I don't, I'm not going to put the, and again, the other thing you need to make sure and be aware of is not to put them on a pedestal. Don't say that, oh, I'm going to worship them. No, just acknowledge what their presence was. Acknowledgement is the important thing here. Acknowledge what their presence was. Acknowledge what they were trying to reflect to you. Because what they're trying to teach you is where you are lacking internally. Mm. That's all you need. To, that's what in shadow what they refer to the integration. When you start the understanding the lesson, that is it, so yeah. powerful. What you just said that is dramatically yeah. powerful, and I think a lot of people with what you just said will just sit back and be like, "Oh my gosh, wow, this is going to change the way I'm." It's going to be like little bell in their head and be like, yeah. "Ding!" Like, <laughs> Yeah. 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 That is amazing. But I also, I wanted to know, I had a question. I want to know your thoughts on it, right? Talking about being authentic and things like that. I wanted to know, are we, are we born authentic or do we become authentic? 
That's a very tough question to ask. <laughs> uh, I know, I thought so question. too. <laughs> um, Just your views, they can change. <laughs> yeah, sure. I've never thought of that one before. That's a new one for me. I'll confess, that's a new one for me. Um, I, I, well, not, yeah, now I'm, I think they're, they're kind of coming in here now. They, they do this from time to time, my team. When I, when I get a dilemma like this, they'll just say, they'll send me an image, a picture, or they'll just give me, they'll drop an idea in my head and I think, okay, right, that's them. Yeah, they've just, they've just told me something. They've explained, thank you. They've just explained to me, um, I, they've just, I've got this flash image of a baby, just a child, a toddler, behaving the way it does. Goo gaga, it does all these goo gaga, it does all these things. It starts to walk, it starts to pick up, it, it might sit next to the dog in the house, right? And it might just start patting the dog on the nose, right? Or on, on its mouth, which is normally what people wouldn't do, but this baby does it. Why does the baby do it? The baby does it because it's, number one, think of it this way, it doesn't care what other people thinks about. He or she doesn't care what he thinks about. Two, he or she thinks, Oh, what a wonderful world. Yeah, I like this. This is nice. <laughs> I get to do this, right? I get to pick up and throw my toys everywhere. Mum and dad have to go and pick it up and put it in the basket. Number three, um, I get to eat what I want. If I have a chocolate, I'll eat one belt bite of it and mum will throw the rest of it in the bin or dad will throw the rest of it in the bin. So toddlers, infants, children, are they really authentic? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, they, they, they are, I would say they are probably the epitome of authenticity. It's what happens is, as they grow up and progress, especially into teenagehood, sort of, um, as they become more and more aware of this environment, when they, and then by the time they're into their teens, they're fully integrated into the environment. That's when the programming has really sunk in. That's what shapes mm. them to be who they're not supposed to be. That's where parents, some, and it depends, I also think it depends on the patterns of the parents themselves, because some parents will be like, oh, try, try football, do you like it? No, I don't like football. Okay, do you like violin? Yeah, I like violin. So there's a parent who is, who has either done enough shadow work or has just been a lucky person to have been brought up very nicely by their parents, or they have been aware to it that maybe their parents forced them to do things that they didn't want to do when they were a child at school, but they thought, right, I'm not going to let my kid go through that. So they've integrated that. They've, they've brought awareness, they've brought it in, they've integrated it, they've learned the lesson, they've broken the pattern because it's not repeating in the family anymore. But if there's a parent saying, no, you're going to go and play football. I don't like playing football, Dad. I don't care. You're going to go and play football. You're going to play football because I want you to be a footballer. I did it. You're going to do it. When, when a parent starts taking that approach, children start suffering. Yeah. Kids start suffering. Teenagers start suffering. Um, young adults... I, I experienced that at the age of 22. I, one, <laughs> um, my dad told me off one day for watching TV at the age of 22. He didn't talk to me because I was watching TV on a Saturday morning, uh, Saturday, on a, a weekend. Um, I was a massive fan of Doctor Who and I was watching on, on TV. <laughs> they, were, they were showing a weekend special because I think it was like the 40th anniversary or something. And I wanted to watch, like they were showing back to back um, classic stories of the classic era and I, I wanted to watch it um, my dad was coaching me in insurance for insurance exams and I was watching it and my dad said what are you doing come on switch it off this is me at the age of 22 an adult switch it off get studying that's not well for a start I mean if I if I explain 10 years ago if I told that to somebody I'd be very embarrassed but no that's not something I want to tell because you know it's like I'm being treated like I'm 14 or 13 uh. 12 but I'm 22 Today, I'm very open about it because I realized, well, actually, it was a lesson. Every time he pushed me, he only empowered me more and more and more and more to say to myself, to my dad, Dad, I'm 28, I'm going. Bye. And I left. Uh, and I'm not, I have looked back, but I thought, you know what? Well, no, nah, this is a life. I'm quite happy here in Spain, teaching kids, do it, having my life. Children are a lot more authentic. Yeah. So much so, I think my guides uh, actually channeled. They would, <laughs> they talk, told one of my clients a similar thing, and they used the same analogy that children are in fact the real gurus and teachers of parents because they're the ones who are teaching. Parents have lost their way at that point in their life. 
they should look to their own children. Sometimes kids, what they say is a lot more authentic. A teacher should learn from a student. I learn more from my student, from my kids, when I teach them than they do from me. Yeah. That's yeah. a fact. Yeah, and I'll, uh, when, I, when, I was, when I was thinking about that question, I was like, are we born authentic or do we become authentic? It really struck me. And then I was like, we are born so authentic. It's the, it's the programming. It's the programming of, of society, religion, parents, families, uh, friends, music, social media. Pornography is massive, especially with teenagers, mm-hmm. young adults. These are, what, are, what are all these? These are... Um, the, these um, mediums of programming, I think I, I was last week and I just, uh, not last week, in the weekend before, I did an IGTV with uh, somebody I, uh, I know um, and she, she, she actually gave me the understanding. She said, why do you think they use the word television? It's tell a vision. It tells you a vision of something. And on what do we see on television? Channels. Channels are like a stream of consciousness, the way I channel. It's a stream of consciousness through TV. What does it do? It programs you. It tells you. Mm. The difference is a television is going to tell you and program your mind what it wants you to do then, which is what is control now. But when you open yourself you know, to a channel directly up there, whatever comes through is authentic. And that how do you know it's how do you think, how do you know it's authentic? Because it pushes your boundary. You might end up being told something you don't want to hear. You might think, oh, um, uh, so will I get married in two years? No, the answer might be about six. So people think, oh, so I have to wait another six years. But it's better to wait for six years because you'll meet the right person. Two years, you might end up with a divorce divorce and a child four years down the line. Which one do you want? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and some parents think, you know, you know, it's horrible having uh, child children going through a divorce because their parents are being immature and they don't want to work their differences out. I know in certain cases it's very difficult because where, you know, one partner's cheated on the other, I get all that. But, um, and then having to explain that to your child, which is impossible. You can't really tell children that that is, you know, but sometimes you have to because it's like, well, where's dad? He's gone off with another woman. Where's mum? She's gone off with another man. It's like, well, you know, or another woman or another man. It's like, well, it, it makes things very difficult for children to understand. Mm. So it is a delicate issue to approach. But some, sometimes, some teenagers, they'll say to their parents, what's on their mind? Why? They are being authentic. But the parents are like, no. Yeah, yeah, because we're told to yeah. <laughs> close our mouth and be well, silent. You, I've, I've just been given another thing. Why do you think you see so many teenagers not wearing their masks? They're rebellious. They're the ones that wanted to... What is that saying? It's saying they want to talk. But the parents, they go to work wearing their masks says a lot. They don't, they're not prepared to speak their truth. They're not prepared to be authentic. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about speaking your truth. Yeah. So what would you say are some practical tips that the audience can incorporate to be a little bit more authentic in their life? Uh, for a start, um, I would say journaling is number one. Get a journal, start writing it down. It doesn't matter what your day was like. Start writing things down about your day, your life. If you're not doing that already, don't worry. It doesn't matter how old you are. Um, I'm 35. I started doing my journaling in January 2018. So about 32 and a half. Um, And I love it. These days, I don't stick to it religiously because of work and stuff. But where I can, I feel need to write something down, I do. And it's, it's great. It's become like a little collection that I can leave behind like a legacy. Think about it this way. If you do that, it's a legacy you can leave behind to your children. If you don't have kids, you can leave it around somebody who you think it's, is going to make use of the knowledge and share it with other people. Um, journaling's great. Another thing um, is meditation. Meditation is key because it brings awareness. Now, a lot of people say, I can't meditate for anything. I can't meditate. It doesn't work for me. The very fact that you resist it means that you've already brought awareness to it. That's the, that's the thing. What somebody who resists temptation says uh, to meditation says, um, I'm not able to do it because it doesn't work for me. Yeah, but you've already brought awareness to it. 
What do you mean? Well, how do, why, why do you think you're holding that view, that opinion? Oh yeah, that's true. Right? Conversation killer. But ask yourself that. You're bringing awareness to it by resisting it. So imagine if you submitted and gave in and just tried without without considering the what the outcome would be. Just be. Uh, if, if, if meditation becomes a problem, YouTube is filled with enough meditations of a wide nut range. I do uh, Bij Mantras, which are for the seven chakras of the body. Um, and it's great fun because by the time you finish doing them, I think there's a track on YouTube for about 21 minutes. They've got ones for about 21 minutes. It's three minutes for each one. My whole body's vibrating. I feel a buzz from my head down to my legs. And I just sit in that buzz and it gives me a kickstart. It's brilliant. It gives me a kickstart. I raise my vibration and I just feel great. That's my morning routine. Um, other thing I would say is uh, spend time in nature. Spending time in nature or developing green fingers. I've got loads of plants in my house now, uh, thanks to my family member who has got me into that this year. Um, and I really like the idea of looking after plants, especially if you're single, if you're living on your own, if you don't have a pet, if you don't have anybody, get yourself a plant. Plants are like children. They'll give you company. There's something that you can spend your time productively, creatively looking after. If you see they're wilting a bit, you get the chance to, to teach yourself a new skill. You get the chance to, to learn uh, how to look after caring. What that will do, plants have taught me a lot about life. The, the shoots, when they're in competition, that should reflect the competition people have in society. They're like children. Kids go to school, they've got competition with one another. When you apply the analogy of that to the external world, plants will teach you a lot. Roses, when they wilt and die, they remind you of the cycle of life and death. Life is beautiful like a rose or a flower, but when it wilts, it's death. Death is obviously very gloomy, but then what happens after death? In its place, another bud springs. So it's a continuous cycle. It keeps going and going and going and going. You look after the plant, it looks after you. So if you can, get, get a few plants, that's great. Lastly, start that project. Be a YouTuber, start that project. Do not give a damn about what anybody else thinks. Don't care about what anybody else thinks. Be a YouTuber. Um, sell your skills. Whatever skills you, sit down, write down what skills you've got, whether it's DIY, this and that. At the moment, I would say offer volunteer work if you can, because a lot of people are losing jobs. If somebody, a work colleague needs some DIY done, get stuck in. If, if, if you can help somebody with sort of food deliveries and stuff to somebody elderly, get stuck in. I know it's a bit dangerous, but if you feel that you don't, you know, you're okay and you know, you're willing enough for the challenge, put yourself out there. Because doing a noble deed, good karma always brings around good results every time. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So all these things are definitely going to help you find your authentic self and express Absolutely. your authentic self. And I know it might seem yes. a bit weird, but it does. It works. It works amazingly. Like you said, doing a good deed, like volunteering, getting in touch with nature, going for that walk, the hike in nature, gardening. Um, I, I love that. Meditating. Yes, I, absolutely beautiful. So I think all those things are, and just doing things, just go and do it. Trust yourself. Don't worry about what other people think. Be you because there's only one you. So, and you get to choose who that one you is. Why not make it amazing? Isn't that right? Yeah. So what, what, what is the secret to being authentic for yourself? Uh, for, for me personally, I'm on my journey. Yeah. Um, all of the above, all of the above uh, aforementioned. Um, plus, um, I mean, I, I would, I would say all of the above and a combination of all my experiences. I mean, I've yeah. changing the mindset of rather than looking at life and playing the blame game, you know, who did what in your life, and family members, ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends, friends that used to be part of your life who, who, you know, you've moved on, but you think, oh, why did I even bother being friends with so-and-so? And just accept that everybody, every single individual had a place in your life at a certain point in time. They all came, they all went, they had their role to play. It's understanding what role that person played in your life, what they were trying to reflect to you, what they were trying to teach you. That is the secret behind it. Because once you start to, and there will be a lot of resistance, do not expect it 
Do not expect it because your ego is going to get in the way. Definitely. I will lay my, my life on it. It will get in the way at some point. And it's a, in a certain sense, it's a good thing because you're, because if, if you achieved everything in a few clicks of a finger, what would be the point of living your life? It's like life would become meaningless. But the journey, the challenge, facing the resistance, facing your fears, creating a life that's authentic for yourself, living your life with your purpose, what's in alignment with your purpose, that is beautiful. That's the challenge. If there was no challenge, if it was that easy, um, it, it'd be so easy for you to create your life. And I think it wouldn't be much of an achievement. I, I listened to uh, this, um, there's, there's a, a group of guys that have done this uh, um, YouTube channel and they do music but it's like reaffirmations with music. Uh, they're called Fearless Motivation. And these guys, uh, one of them's got, and one of the, one of the audios I listen to, um, he, he actually says, athletes, entrepreneurs alike, do you think that they, do you think if, if they were given everything on a silver spoon, do you think everybody wants to listen to those stories? No, nobody wants to hear the story about the person who was given, gifted everything on a silver plate with a golden spoon, no. Everybody wants to look up to that athlete. Everybody wants to look up to that entrepreneur who has put themselves through the pain. Men and women who have broken themselves and reconstructed themselves to get themselves to where they are. That is the inspirational story that every man, woman and child wants to hear. And it's so true. It is. It's so true. That's so true. The story of how they became authentic, the story of how they became themselves, who they are, to share it. Yeah, and I'll tell that story. Share. I mean, the way I share my story, um, tell people about it. Don't be afraid about, oh, is, is someone thinking about whether I should... Um, I'm, I'm talking too much. Don't care. If the person thinks like that, it means that at least you are able to speak your truth. He or she can't. They're resisting. That's the way to look at it. They're resisting. You are facing your resistance. You're going. You're going with the flow. That's why you're not resisting. You're and you have. A, and you'll have a good night's sleep. <laughs> and you do. It does. Honestly, yeah, it's true. You do have a good night's sleep. You get <laughs> do you like? You go to bed. You're like. Oh, that was yeah, good. <laughs> so it's true. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, look. Absolutely so much value and knowledge packed into this podcast. I mean, I could sit here and talk to you for hours and hours and hours. And I think we're going to have to have another podcast episode soon to dive deeper into certain aspects that we spoke about. I mean, we just went on, you know, we didn't even dive a bit deeper that we could have gone in. We just went on the basis. So I really appreciate it. But before we finish up, I ask all my audience, as this is the Natural Health Podcast, what is your secret natural health hack that you do every day or every second day? Well, for me, um, I try to drink as much water as I can. It sounds a bit cliche, but it, it is important. Um, I, I use uh, air, breathing. Um, I, I, you know, I'm quickly sure there's, um, uh, there's a technique for yoga, a breathing, yoga breathing. It uh, activates the third eye, activates uh, the crown, but also what it does is it oxygenates your cells. It wakes you up in the morning. Uh, it's called, in Sanskrit, it's called pranayam. So basically you take your thumb, you put it on your right nostril, right? And you can use visualizations. You can visualize that light going through. Breathe in, hold it for 16 seconds or for as long as you, you, you want. Try not to breathe it, hold in for too long because otherwise you might end up collapsing, which obviously you don't want to. So just take your time, do it for five seconds, 10 seconds. And then we're using these two uh, mudras, these two fingers, put them here, you can hold it together, and then release your thumb and breathe out the left. Visualize uh, anything, is something like, what I do is I visualize light going in. I visualize my, my body and I feel my aura expanding. That's one of the things that I do. And uh, I, I use my two fingers and I breathe out and I imagine like a, a, like a smoke, a dark or gray, black colored smoke coming out. And that's, and I reaffirm, I receive guiding light. I release that which no longer serves me. Do that three times in a day. You can do it, well, literally just do that, 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 that. Do it three times in the morning. That will kickstart your day. Um, ideally do it first thing when you get out of bed uh, because you can, you can do I mean, I, I've got uh, classes early in the morning sometimes on a Monday to Thursday, so it's a bit difficult for me. 
So I normally wait for my classes to finish and then I only have the one. So then I, then I do it after. But if you do it first thing in the morning, it's a lot more beneficial. Particularly if you, if you can, try and wake up at uh, 5. 5 a.m. wake up before sunrise is great. Watch the sunrise, the sun's energy on the skin. Um, it stimulates vitamin D, so that's for health and immunity, which is particularly what people need at the minute. Um, it also is, uh, well, if you, it depends on what part of the world you live in. If you live very north or very south, you might not get as much sunshine all year round. But if you can, just uh, going a bit, uh, a bit of Wim Hof, uh, for those of you who know Wim, not Wim Hof is, expose yourself to the cold. Even if it means going standing out in the balcony, it's minus one, do it. For one minute, feel the, the, the cold, feel the warmth, make it a part of you. I think wow. that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's absolutely brilliant. And that's, you know, some people can incorporate that in their morning or night routine and that's just going to impact them. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to awaken them. It's going to allow them to be themselves. And it's just simple things like that. So I really, really appreciate it. And I mean, there's audience that have that are listening to this podcast and are like, Oh my gosh, where can I find you? How can I get in contact with you? Where can they find you? Nim? So, uh, yeah, so if, if anybody wants to contact me, if they just want to reach out for a chat or if they want to um, interview me or they want to have a session for channeling or Reiki or just talk about shadow work, uh, you can find me and DM me uh, at Divine Knowledge 1111 um, on my Instagram. Alternatively, you can drop a comment on any of my YouTube videos. I normally upload once a week. Uh, I will be shoot, shooting one tonight and uploading it over the weekend at Divine Knowledge ASMR 1111. And I'll link that all below so you can, you can link on that and click on it and follow this amazing, beautiful individual who has put away their time to share such amazing knowledge and has been vulnerable throughout the whole podcast. And I really, really, really appreciate that because that takes, that takes energy, that takes um, power, that takes being authentic to be able to do that. So thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, Nim. Thank you, Mihaela. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for joining us at the Natural Health Podcast. And remember, the missing link between failure and success is your health.